one of the train models. Okay, thanks for the introduction and thanks, thanks for coming. So as you all know, the uh, understanding why most organisms reproduce sexually, at least from time to time, uh, still represents one of the key issues in uh, evolutionary biology. And so very briefly, where are we now on this question? Well, from the theoretical side, we have a number of uh, plausible scenarios which have been around for some time now, under which uh, biparental sexual reproduction can be favored over clonal or more generally uniparental reproduction due to the fact that sex can break uh, genetic associations either within or between your side uh, and generate novel genotypes. And so these different scenarios correspond to different mechanisms that can uh, generate genetic associations such as the Hill-Robertson effect in uh, finite populations or uh, epistatic interactions among loci and in particular fluctuating epistasis such as in, uh, in uh, red queen co-evolutionary models. From the empirical side, uh, these theories uh, are notoriously difficult to test in uh, natural populations. So ideally, when we would want to be able to compare the performances of uh, sexual and asexual individuals in their natural environment, which is often difficult. So there are not so many studies on uh, natural populations, and we definitely need uh, more of that. But in the meantime, a number of uh, very interesting results came out over the last years from uh, experimental evolution studies. And we will hear more about that just in, in the next talk. So using organisms that can reproduce both uniparentally and biparentally, like uh, monogonon photophores or uh, C. elegans or yeast. And in some of these studies, in particular in the study by uh, Bates and Agrawal here, the authors were able to uh, compare the fitness distributions of uh, sexually and asexually produced individuals during adaptation, and so to test some uh, predictions from uh, theoretical models. However, something which is still missing somehow from the theoretical models is how exactly can we relate uh, this, this kind of measures to what should be the strength of selection for sex in, uh, in those populations. And so in order to uh, try to go into this direction, I've been using uh, quantitative trait models. And here are two results from the uh, uh, haploid population model, where individuals can reproduce both uh, sexually and asexually. Okay, so I assume that each generation, uh, individuals invest a proportion one minus sigma of their resources into asexual reproduction by mitosis, and a proportion sigma into sexual reproduction, in which case they produce gametes. I assume that uh, gametes fuse at random in the population, and that fertilization is immediately followed by the meiosis. Okay, I can introduce a direct cost of sex into this model by assuming that only a proportion one over C of the resources invested into sexual reproduction will actually result in the production of, uh, of new organisms. So if C is one, there is no cost of sex. If C is two, there's a, there's a two-fold cost of sex. And of course, we want to know how the, the investment into sex, or what we call the, the rate of sex sigma, uh, evolves in this, uh, in this model. So in the following, I will call fitness the, the overall investment of the individual into reproduction, so it's, it's overall fecundity. And I will assume that it depends on uh, the values of uh, an arbitrary number n of a quantitative uh, phenotypic trait. And as usual in this kind of model, I assume that the value of uh, phenotypic trait i in an individual has both the genetic and environmental components, which are independent. And I also assume that all the loci that affect uh, trait i uh, have additive effects. And then I consider some form of uh, normalizing selection against uh, uh, around uh, an optimal phenotype. So here, for example, we have a, a Gaussian-shaped fitness function. But the model is actually more general, and the results that we show uh, don't depend on the, the specific form of the fitness. <coughs> okay, and then I will assume that the distribution of uh, phenotypic traits in the population is uh, normally uh, Gaussian. So here we have our fitness function and the distribution of uh, phenotypes, which is entirely uh, determined by the, the mean trait values and the genetic variance covariance matrix, which holds the variances and covariances uh, between these uh, genetic variables. And so typically, this kind of model selection will uh, generate linkage disequilibria between the side due to uh, the of fitness, which will then affect these uh, genetic variances and covariances. 
and those sakes will uh, break this linkage equilibrium will have some consequences in terms of mean fitness and uh, adaptation. Okay, and, and finally, uh, the last assumption is that the, so I, I assume that the, the rate of sex, the investment into sex sigma, is also a quantitative polygenic trait, uh, with also a genetic and uh, environmental uh, contributions. And in the following, I will call G sigma sigma the genetic variance for the rate of sex, so the primitive variance in the, the rate of sex in the population. So what are the results? It's possible to write an expression for the change in the average rate of, rate of sex per generation, which decomposes into three terms. The first is simply the, the effect of the cost of sex, so direct selection against sex, which is proportional to the heritable variance in the rate of sex, which of course depends on the, the value of the cost of sex. And then indirect selection in turn, so due to the effect of sex on the linkage disequilibria, uh, decomposes into two terms, which correspond to what's often called the, the long-term and the short-term effect in this kind of model. So here the long-term effect uh, writes like this. It's a sum of all phenotypic traits that affect fitness of uh, the selection gradient for trait I, so which measures the, the strength of directional selection on trait I, multiplied by the, the genetic covariance between the investment into sex and the trait I. And then the short-term effects write a bit similarly to the sum over all possible pairs of traits I and J, including I equal J, of uh, this selection gradient, which measures how mean fitness changes as we change the genetic variances and covariances among traits, times this term, which is the third order moment between the rate of sex and traits I and J. So this shows how uh, genetic variances and covariances differ between subsets of the population with higher rates of sex or lower rates of sex. Okay, then if we want to go further, and uh, we need to uh, obtain expressions for these genetic covariances and uh, third order moments. And for this, I will need to make some extra assumptions. So I will assume a very large population so that can, I can neglect the effects of genetic drift. And then I will use uh, the QLE approximations, which means that I assume that the recombination rates between loci are sufficiently high, uh, which means that uh, the rate of sex in the population cannot be too low. And finally, I assume that the, the heritable variance in the rate of sex is a uh, small population. Okay, and by doing these different assumptions, I can arrive at uh, another expression for the mean rate of cha uh, change, the change in the mean rate of sex per generation. So it is proportional again to the heritable variance in the rate of sex. And then the selection gradient composes into again these three terms. So the effect of the cost of sex that we've already seen. And then we have a short-term and a long-term selection gradient, which can be written like this. So this is the short-term effect. So we see that it's affected by the cost of sex and by the, the mean rate of sex in the population. And then we have this uh, one per R three term here, which represents the effect of a genetic architecture. So what is this R three? It, it is a harmonic average over all possible triplets of loci i, j, and k where locus i affects the rate of sex and loci j and k affect fitness of uh, this quantity r i j k which is simply the probability that at meiosis we have at least one recombination event between those uh, three, three loci. So under completely free recombination, no linkage, this r3 is uh, 3 over 4 which provides a lower bound on this uh, 1 over r3 term. And then what is this delta 1? Well, if we imagine an experiment like in the study by Bex and Agrawal I was mentioning, where we sample individuals from the population and we let them reproduce sexually and asexually and compare the mean fitness of those offspring, well, this delta 1 is simply the difference between the, the log mean fitness of sexually and asexually produced offspring. Okay, so it's the, the short-term effect of sex, it's the immediate effect of sex on the, on the mean fitness. And finally, the long-term selection gradient writes a bit similarly. So again, we have a first term which depends on, uh, on uh, genetic architecture, uh, this one over R4. It's again an average for all possible triplets of loci uh, I, J, and K in the genome. And now it also involves this uh, pairwise recombination rate between I and J and I and K. And on the free recombination, uh, this R4 equals 3 over 8, which again provides a lower bound on this uh, 1 over R4. 
to, to be higher as we get up to increase the leakage. And finally, what is this delta 2? Well, if we start uh, from the same experiment I was mentioning, so we sample individuals from our population, let them reproduce sexually and asexually, and now we let these offspring reproduce, so according to their, their fitness, to produce a, a new generation. Okay, so if there is um, if there is directional selection, we expect that mean fitness should increase about this extra generation. And this delta two is simply the difference between uh, the increase in fitness between sexually produced individuals and their offspring, and the increase in fitness between asexually produced individuals and their offspring. Okay, so it's the long-term effect of sex, but you see that it's not so long-term, it's just after one single extra generation. What is the effect of sex in terms of uh, improved efficiency of uh, selection? Okay, so I have started to do some uh, multi-locus, individual-based simulations to test uh, these results, so I, I don't really have time to go into the, the simulation models, but uh, the, at least the preliminary, so in, I can measure the uh, estimate the selection, the short and long-term selection by uh, measuring these uh, genetic covariances uh, and third order moments between the, the rate of sex and the genetic traits, and compare that with, uh, with this expression that I showed you. So, in the, in the simulations, I, I make these experiments with the sample of individuals that are producing offspring sexually and asexually. And so, overall, it, uh, it fits reasonably well as long as the, the baseline rate of sex in the population is not too low. But, uh, but the, the approximations tend to overestimate the, um, the selection gradients, uh, actually due to the quasi linkage equilibrium uh, approximation. So if I, often if I use a simpler expression with a free recombination, I, uh, it fits better to the, uh, to the simulation gradients. So, so in conclusion, we've seen that using these uh, general quantitative trait models, it's possible to obtain general expressions for uh, selection gradient for sex in terms of measurable quantities, so the effect of sex on the mean fitness of offspring and the response to selection. So it also depends on these uh, terms uh, depending on genetic architecture, which are less accessible, but at least we can have some uh, lower bounds on these terms. So according to these preliminary simulation results, uh, these can provide correct predictions at least on the order of magnitude of selection for sex, as long as the rate of sex is not too low in the population. And finally, I need to do more simulation result, uh, more simulations to explain, to explore more general scenarios with uh, different sorts of uh, changing environments and different uh, shapes of fitness functions. Okay, with this I will end and uh, be happy to take questions.